Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Statistics Solutions webinar on Chapter 5. Uh, before we get started, I just want to tell you a little bit about who we are um, and let you know that um, if you look in the chat box, the webinar chat box, um, you see some links. Um, and, and also some information to let you know that you will be receiving um, the webinar, recording of the web webinar, the slide deck, um, your email. Um, there's also links to our website um, where we offer um, all kinds of, we have all kinds of free resources, um, chapter guidelines, blogs, um, information on statistical analyses so there's all kinds of uh, there's a wealth of information there on dissertations um we also uh, archive the webinars there so this webinar and other webinars will be archived there um so it's just you know good to check out our website see what we offer for free the uh, resources um also, who we are, we're a dissertation consulting company, uh, full service. We offer um, assistance with a range of, of services, uh, you know, including help with chapters, uh, statistics. So anyway, it's worth checking out our website. Um, also, the sorry, that's the, <laughs> that's the slide I wanted. Um, it's a little bit of information about us and our contact information, and you can make a you know, an appointment to talk to somebody for free to just about to see, um, let them know what you need and to see if what we offer is right for you. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. And we'll have this, um, this contact information up at the end as well. Uh, we will have a question and answer session at the end. Um, just hold your questions until the end. Uh, if you want to type them into the chat box or into the question and answer box so you don't forget them as we go along, that's fine, but I won't get to them until the end. All right, so um, <clears throat> chapter five, the discussion. If you are at this stage in the dissertation, congratulations, because um, that's it's quite an accomplishment and you're near the end. Um, if you're just looking ahead, um, just kind of getting a sense of what's ahead in chapter five, you're not there yet, of course, that's fine too. Um, but if you are there, um, congratulations. This is, um, you, you are near the end. Um, you're not at the, you know, you're not done yet, of course. <laughs> There's still work to do. Um, but nonetheless, um, it, you should applaud yourself for getting this far. Um, because it's quite, you know, it's, it's quite an accomplishment. Uh, but the chapter five or um, the end, the very end of the, the dissertation is the discussion where you discuss your results and interpret your results, um, make recommendations for further research. Now, our, our model of the dissertation follows the five chapter model. There are other models out there, um, you know, always be sure to check your, your school's dissertation template. Um, you know, sometimes dissertations will have six chapters, seven chapters, but usually the last one is, is usually the discussion, um, no matter what chapter it is. Um, but like I said, ours follows a standard five chapter model. Um, this is where, you know, after you have your results, you present your results in chapter four, you, discuss what you found, you interpret what you found in chapter five. You also talk about um, what that means for research, what that means for practice. So here are the things we're gonna cover today. These are pretty standard components and features of the discussion chapter. Um, again, always use your school's template because it may have specifics that are particular to the school. Sometimes the um, these sections are in different orders. Sometimes they're called different things, even though they're they're very close. Um, so this ours is going to act like a good a kind of standard, um, you know, good kind of common template. Um, again, with the caveat that you know you should, of course, um, follow the particulars of your uh, your school's template. All right. 
Uh, usually, you know, like any other chapter, the discussion chapter starts off with an introduction. Um, usually just to get started, the, the, the introduction is usually not going to be long. Um, it's best to remind the reader um, of what, you know, your purpose and why you conducted your study. So a good way to do that is just to restate the purpose of your study at the very beginning. The purpose of the study was to, just to remind the reader of its purpose. Now, when you do restate the purpose, anywhere in the study, um, your purpose is kind of like your research questions in the sense that once your research questions are nailed down, um, and once your purpose is nailed down, it doesn't change. In other words, if you have to restate it, um, the purpose statement, if you have to restate it somewhere um, else in the study, again, um, you use you use that language verbatim. You don't change it, right? Because that that encapsulates what's, uh, what your study is about. Same with the research questions. Um, they don't change. The wording doesn't change because that matters, that wording. Um, so restate the purpose of your study at the very beginning. Remind the reader um, of the importance of your study or the, why your study was needed. This is going to sound similar to research problem material in chapter one. Uh, you don't want to copy and paste that. Um, again, just the purpose statement itself. Um, but remind the reader, again, of um, why your study was needed, what the research problem was. Um, again, and this is just to kind of reorient your reader um, at the very beginning of the chapter. You can also preview contents of the chapter if you want. Um, you know, this chapter will contain the following sections and then list the sections um, in the chapter. Okay, the next section, usually called something like interpretation of the findings. Sometimes it's called discussion of the findings. Um, I know that's a little confusing because it's the discussion chapter, but sometimes it'll be called discussion of the findings or again, interpretation of the findings, something like that. But the um, the idea is the same. This is where you, this is the kind of the heart of the chapter five. This is where you're, or the discussion chapter. This is where you're gonna want to um, kind of talk about what your findings mean, kind of interpret them, discuss them. And uh, what, what is really meant by that is um, you want to discuss your findings in relation to the findings of previous research. And then you can make conclusions based on that uh, and interpretations based on that. And we'll get to that in a minute. But um, you go going to want to ha um, organize this section um, well, uh, because let's say you have, you know, you have several research questions, three, four or five research questions. You start talking about all the findings. It's going to get confusing uh, if you don't have an organizational strategy here. And the easiest way to do this is just to section this out by research questions. Um, or use if it's if it's quantitative, if it's qualitative. You can section it out by your themes, right? Uh, where you take one research question, state it, summarize the results, and then start talking about what you found in relation to previous research uh, for that research question. Um, then you do the same for the next research question have a subsection for it if it's themes it's uh for qualitative it's it's pretty similar um except you're just using theme one theme two theme three you know state your themes summarize it a bit um and then start talking about um how your theme relates to previous literature and the previous literature that you're going to be pulling from is, is going to be found in your lit review Right. This is the connection between the discussion chapter and the lit review chapter. Um, so, for example, when you're talking about theme one, um, what you part of what you want to do is you want to come out and be explicit about um, does it support or does it not support, you know, major findings from previous research that you reviewed in chapter two. Um, this is the same for quantitative too. It's the same kind of approach. If it's research question one, um, lay out your findings, um, you know, state very clearly this um, does not support or it does support, um, you know, the findings of so-and-so. Um, 
you're situating your findings in relation to previous research, noting where it supports it or where it doesn't. If, if previous research is mixed, you know, shows, you know, different, different findings, you're just going to have to kind of situate your uh, findings um, in relation to those mixed findings and, and talk about, you know, what set of findings it actually does support and what it doesn't. Um, the idea here is that um, if your findings support previous research, then whatever it is you looked at for that RQ or whatever theme that represents um, is that you can make a conclusion, right? If you can, uh, if your, your findings support what previous research says, then you can make a conclusion about that, right? Um, if your findings don't support previous research, then that indicates there's some kind of inconclusiveness, right? Which might indicate a need for more research. Um, so that's the idea. Um, you know, bring in sources um, from your chapter two, like I said, to, um, to, to help, you know, discuss um, your findings and what they mean. Um, also, if something is new or unexpected, you, you're definitely going to want to discuss that, right? Um, this is something new to the research or, or unexpected finding. Um, definitely bring that in to discuss. Um, right. And the whole idea here is to be able to make conclusions. Um, you know, if you're um, finding supported previous research or not. Um, and that's the idea with the interpretation of the finding section. Um, again, section it out, right, based on your RQs or your hypotheses or based on your themes and just kind of repeat the that that kind of strategy of interpretation with the previous lit literature um, for each research question or for each theme. And to backtrack just a little uh, with the chapter five, um, there's going to be a tendency to kind of rush through the chapter five and, and I get it. Um, it's the end and you're, <laughs> you might be tired of the dissertation. It's been long. It's been trying. Um, it's a lot of work um, and you just want to be done. And, and I understand, but um, the chapter five is important. I mean, this is where you're going to, you know, this is what all the work is leading to, right. Um, what you found, what it means. Um, recommendations for practice, recommendations for further research. Um, so kind of take your time with the five, don't rush through it. And, and the reason for that, you know, one is obviously you want to do a good job. Number two is um, just practically speaking, you know, when you rush through it, that can create more work for you on the back end, right? Because um, your professor is going to say, oh, well, you need to flesh this out more. You didn't give this a good treatment. This needs to be more in depth. So it's going to have to go to your you know, your professor is going to have to come back um, and it's going to have to go back again. So the more you can cut down on that back and forth, now there's always going to be some back and forth because that's just the way the process works. Um, but, you know, don't rush the five is an important point I'm trying to say here, and especially this, this section here. Um, if you use your resources like our webinars, you know, online resources, chapter guides, you know, use all that. But at the end of the day, too, sometimes it's just there's no better um, kind of piece of help than having an example, right, of a chapter or a, a, an approved dissertation from your school, kind of in your area. If you can get one of those or, you know, you probably already have one if you're on Chapter 5 that you've been using. But, you know, look at how uh, other people have handled these sections. Look what they put in there um, as an example. Sometimes it's just great to have a concrete example at hand when you sit down to write. Um, if you need to know where to look for um, dissertations, um, ProQuest. Um, and you should have access to your academic library. Um, ProQuest, I put it in the webinar chat box. Um, ProQuest uh, publishes every, dissertations, right? Everybody's dissertation. So they, um, you can have access to them. So if you want to go get a, a complete 
you know, finish dissertation from your school, you can go to ProQuest and search whatever your school is and um, and find dissertations that are close to yours as examples for some of these sections. Um, okay, that's the interpretation of the finding section. And that's the kind of the link to chapter two is that that chapter two um, contains that previous literature that you're gonna to wanna to go back to and look at. Now, a couple questions here. Um, one question, do you need to bring in new research um, into the chapter five? Uh, it, it's not a straight up yes or no answer, but mostly no, you do not need to bring new research into the chapter five. You can, but you don't need to typically. Now, having said that, sometimes chairs will want you to do a little mini um, search, article search. In other words, they want you to look for anything that might have come out in the, you know, the, the year, two years, three years, however long it's been that you've been writing your dissertation. They want you to do a little quick search to see if, hey, has anything come out on your topic um, in those few years? Usually it's nothing. Sometimes there might be uh, um, a few articles or studies that have come out. Um, and if, if that happens, they want you to include those um, if, it, if it pertains. But usually you do not need to bring in new material to the chapter five. Um, another question, um, mixed methods. Um, you've, you have a quantitative portion and a qualitative portion. How do you handle this section? Um, well, usually, for mixed methods, usually there's one kind of approach is predominant. Like you have a, uh, you know, predominantly quantitative approach, but you just have a little a qualitative section to kind of give you some extra insight on the quantitative material. Um, if that's the case, you know, something like that, then obviously direct more of the interpretation of the findings toward the quantitative portion, right? Since that is the, the major portion of your, um, of your study. And if the qualitative uh, part was just kind of minimal and it was just to kind of give you some insight into that, you could probably include that qualitative material if it's appropriate or where it's appropriate in the discussion with the quantitative material. You probably don't even need a separate section. Now, if, the, uh, the study was kind of, you know, 50-50, like each quantitative approach, qualitative approach, they had, um, you know, kind of equal weight. Um, there's different ways to handle it. I mean, obviously ask your chair if they have a preference, they may or they may not. Um, you can do an interpretation of the findings for each approach if you want, if that works, and then have kind of a section after that where you kind of unify them. Um, or you can kind of mix them in together if that works. Um, so there's no hard and fast rule on that. It's just whatever kind of um, makes sense and um, allows you to present the material and talk about the material in, in um, you know, in an effective manner. Okay, so after the interpretation of the finding section, again, this is the, you know, this is the meat of the chapter because everything's gonna kind of follow from this. Um, usually there's a small limitation section, um, you know, limitations are things, um, shortcomings, weaknesses that may have affected, um, the results of your study. Um, a good thing to do starting off here, I mean, is to, um, go back to chapters one and or chapters three, um, because usually, in those chapters in the proposal, you talk about limitations. You know, of course, at that point, it's forward looking. Chapter one or chapter three, you're thinking about what might be limitations for the study. So go back to those sections. See if you thought were going to be limitations at the time actually ended up being limitations. Um, that's a place to start. Um, 
other things to consider about limitations. I mean, a, a major limitation, for example, for um, quantitative research is a low sample size that um, reduces your statistical certainty. It also reduces the generalizability of your findings. Um, so light, low sample size would be a, a major limitation of quantitative find, uh, research. Qualitative research, um, you know, if you're too close to a subject, um, sometimes researcher bias can be a, a, a potential limitation. If, you know, that was the case, you would want to talk about it a little bit and then talk about ways that you, you steps you took to mitigate or prevent researcher bias. Um, sometimes, um, you know, self-reported instruments, they kind of have an inherent limitation in that, um, you know, the information is self-reported that, that participants report themselves. It's not, in other words, it's not objective. It's not like grades or, or you know, performance in indexes that, uh, that are objective. Um, it's still subjective at it's, it's some point, right? Student, um, I'm sorry, self-reported uh, instruments. Um, so, so those are limitations that, that can um, affect your, your, your results. Um, usually in the section, they want you to talk about generalizability of your results to the larger study population. Um, you know, if your, if your study is quantitative, um, sample size is, like I said, that, that a big deal. Um, if you met your sample, if you perform G power analysis and you, you know, you met your sample size requirements, um, chances are you're, your results should generalize pretty well. Now there's certain things that are going to affect that up or down, um, you know, convenient sampling. It's gonna kind of reduce your generalizability a little bit. Random sampling increases it. Um, for qualitative studies, um, your results are not, qualitative studies usually involve interviews. Um, and usually involve a low sample size and that's by design. So if you interv interviewed say 10 people, um, that's by design because you can't, you know, you can't under, you, you can't um, interview a hundred people. Um, also, you don't need to, there's something called saturation where you, you start getting the same answers over and over. So you really don't need to um, interview that many people. So you interviewed 10 people, that's a low sample size. However, um, qualitative, research is not meant to generalize, right? It's meant to get in-depth information, um, you know, dig into participants' experiences the way that quantitative studies with large sample size can't do. So it's worth mentioning that if your study is qualitative, that um, your results won't generalize, but by design, they're not meant to. That's the limitation section. Um, next is usually called some of the implications for practice um, or recommendations for practice. And this is just like it sounds, um, you know, based on what you found, what do you recommend um, for folks at the level of practice, right? Um, what, I think of value, you think of your results having value, right? Informational value. Um, to whom would this information be valuable and how would it be valuable to them? What would it tell them? How could it inform what they do? So in other words, if you, if you for example, rather, um, if you conducted an education study and you, um, you studied why uh, special education teachers leave the field, and you get to this section, well, think about it. Um, you found all these, these several reasons why um, special education teachers leave the field. Who, who would find value in that information? Uh, certainly teachers themselves, but I think the real value would be to administrators, right? Um, people who do the hiring, people who have to, um, you know, want to see these teachers be retained, who wants to see them succeed, um, who, um, you know, the administrators who schedule um, or who encourage them to take professional development, right? So um, 
So you could talk about what that means for educators, how that can inform what they do, the professional development that they run for them, the incentives, the incentives they provide for the teachers. OK, so um, that's what the section is about. What does it mean? What does your information mean for practice? How can it inform people um, in the area um, about what they do? Right. Um, professional. Recommendations for further research. Um, this is also common, and you see this in the studies you read near the end. Um, what, based on what you found, and sometimes based on limitations um, of your your study, what do you recommend that researchers focus on moving forward? Um, and these are not general recommendations, right? These are recommendations based on what you found. Um, and again, can be based on limitations, and I'll get there in a minute. Um, so what are some examples? So findings that um, don't support previous research, findings that are at odds with previous research, um, they can warrant further research because, again, if your findings don't support previous research, that suggests some kind of inclusive uh, inconclusiveness right um so maybe more research is needed to get more conclusive findings uh any finding that is novel or that is unexpected definitely deserves to be mentioned uh for further research um let's see limitations re recommendations based on limitations let's say you had a limitation in your study well the idea would be to um just basically recommend replicating the study, but that researchers address that particular thing that was a limitation in your study. Um, you can also recommend different kinds of studies to get different kinds of information. Okay, so let's say, um, go back to our example about um, special education teachers leaving the field, right? You conducted uh, for the sake of, of example, you conducted a qualitative study. You know, you asked teachers why they you got some really nice and depth uh, information from them. But um, you could recommend that if we wanted to understand this phenomenon uh, more holistically, more comprehensively, you could do a case study, right? Where you could then you could ask the teachers. You could also talk to administrators, right? Um, principals, see what their take is on it. You could also look at internal documents, right? Because if it's a case study, you need multiple data sources. You could look at internal documents, maybe lesson plans, maybe do observations of teachers, right, in the classroom. Um, so you could recommend a different kind of study to get different kinds of information, all right? Um, but if you do that, which of course is good, it's fine. Um, you want to talk a little bit about why you're recommending that and what what kind of information it could give you, right? Don't just say, "Hey, a case study would be great to conduct." You know, follow up on that. Okay, why a case study? And again, it would be about giving you different kinds of information, more comprehensive, holistic, uh, you know, view of the topics. So yeah, recommend different kinds of studies to obtain different kinds of information. Um, and here we are at the summary. I mean, the chapter five is not long. It's not that involved. Um, most of the involving nature of it really comes in the interpretation of the finding section, right? And then, and then putting your head to, you know, what are you going to you know, recommend or discuss for the implications for practice and the, and the recommendations for further research. Now, <clears throat> consult your template. Again, I'm going to say it. Um, I know I've said it a few times, but I'm going to say it again because some schools let you end at recommendations for future further research. Okay. Um, some schools want a summary or a conclusion at the end, um, which is fine. If if they do want a conclusion or a summary, um, you know, remember that it's a summary for the chapter. Um, so you want to recap the most important points of the chapter, just like any summary, but it's also the end of your study, right? Um, so you want a good take-home message. You want, um, you want to leave the reader with the most important things about your study or the most important findings about your study. 
Um, that's what you want to leave them with. So that's the kind of take home message. You know, I always say, sell your, sell your studies, sell your findings at the very end. Um, you know, what was important about it? What, you know, what, what, what made it significant? What made it important? Um, even if your findings weren't significant, I know I just used that word. Um, that's okay. People get, sometimes get discouraged. And so you're a researcher, you, you, you know, you, you get what you get, um, but insignificant findings c can still tell us things, right? Um, insignificant findings, or non—I say non-significant findings—they still they still can tell us something. Uh, you know, maybe that theory or that approach wasn't right. Um, you know, maybe it didn't work for this population. Whatever you did, um, so just at the end here you know, recap major points of the uh, chapter, but also sell your findings, you know, end with the take home message about what you want to leave your, your reader with. Okay. And that's, that's it for the chapter five. I mean, it's, um, they're usually not long. I'm going to say, you know, for a quantitative chapter five, 10 to 12 pages um, for a qualitative chapter five, 10 to 15, you know, under 20. Um, you know, if it's, it's shorter than that, you're probably not saying enough. If it's longer than that, you're probably going on too far, too much. Um, but again, you know, your, all schools have different, uh, well, not always, but schools can have different um, requirements, but, but that's usually a general rule of thumb. And um, that's it. Unless you have questions, um, I'm going to give you a few minutes to type your questions in the question and answer box or the chat box. Um, and I'm going to leave this slide up for now uh, because this is our contact information, our phone number, email, um, if, you know, a few words about what we offer. So if you have questions and um Ah, thank you very much from Ireland. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. Um, nice. Any any questions? Um, just type them in, and I'll try to answer them for you. Oh, you're welcome, everybody. Great. Thank you, everybody. Doesn't look like there's any questions. Um, Remember, you're going to get a copy of this. Um, check out our website. We have uh, all kinds of free resources on there, blogs, chapter uh, guides, everything else. Um, great. You're welcome, everybody. Thank you for the kind words, and uh, have a great rest of your day. Thank you.